let's get going here. Um, hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Tim Lorden, and I'm the executive director of an organization called the Internet Education Foundation. And um, I wanted to welcome everybody here today and um, invite you to um, this discussion of you know, prospects for legislative prospects for funding computer science education, largely for high school and middle school students, which is not, you know, our area of focus. Um, the event today is called Seeding the Workforce of the Future, Legislative Pro Prospects for Computer Science Education. And it's hosted by you know, us, uh, the State of the Net series, which we do a lot of uh, internet policy about. And then also the Congressional App Challenge, which is actually the um, House of Representatives official, official student coding competition for high school and middle school students. Um, we were appointed by the Committee on House Administration to organize that competition for the about 300 plus members of the house who host uh, district competitions in their district and really proud to do so. So, and, and our focus is on computer science education and inspiring students to pursue code. And um, that's kind of why we're here. Um, if you want to follow along, um, we're gonna be posting materials and information about this conversation on Twitter and Instagram using the, the hashtag Congress for CS. And that's Congress numeric for CS. Um, and feel free to you know, ask questions and post comments uh, along where our Twitter accounts are at Congressional AC and SOTN um, if you wanted to tag us as well. So let me just kind of give some context on why we're here. Um, the, since the, obviously we run programs for inspiring students to pursue computer science and code. Um, however, um, a huge number of students all across America um, don't have access to computer science classes or computer science education um, and things like that. And it's, it's kind of shocking how very few people uh, and students in the country have access to those materials and teachers have not had the resources to teach computer science in school. But if, you know, if we're looking for the future workforce of America to deal with a future proof infrastructure, we're obviously going to need um, a domestic pipeline of coding talent. Um, in America. And in the past several weeks since the 117th Congress started, um, we've seen about a dozen bills drop in Congress um, seeking to fund computer science or, and or STEM programs um, for students across America. It, it's, and it's an interesting development. Um, it probably follows in the fact that the Biden administration um, has put forward their infrastructure package um, which kind of includes something called the American Jobs Plan, um, which neither have been introduced, but they're negotiating that in Congress right now. Um, but the, the fact sheet for the American Jobs Plan um, includes $48 billion for building the capacity of the existing, work for, for, of the existing workforce development. Um, I'll, I'll read just the provisions that are in the American Jobs Plan, just, just, and we'll put this on Twitter as well so you, you can see this. It says, these investments include the creation of career pathway programs in middle and high school students, prioritizing increased access to computer science and high quality career and technical programs that connect underrepresented students to STEM and in-demand sectors through partnerships with both institutions of higher education and employers. So the bill that's being negotiated by the Biden administration in Congress right now is supposed to include $48 billion that includes computer science and STEM funding. Um, this, you know, is an interesting development, um, and we haven't been this, you know, our interest hasn't been this peaked about computer science education since we started the computer science, I mean, the, the Congressional App Challenge about six or seven years ago. So it's pretty exciting. Um, but before we get into an expert panel of people to discuss the prospects of funding and who, how it should be funded, um, because that description that I just read you wasn't very detailed, and there's a lot of details to fill in when it comes to $48 billion, perhaps. Um, I, I want to introduce um, two members um, who have been kind of leaders on um, computer science education um, to just make a few remarks. Um, I want to first introduce um, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who represents the 13th District of California. Um, she currently serves on the Budget Committee and the Powerful Appropriations Committee, which is essentially where the money comes from. Um, it oversees the federal government spending. Uh, she serves on the Subcommittee on Health and Human Services Education of that Appropriations Committee, which is super important for this for this purpose. Um, she also serves as the co-chair of the Policy and Steering Committee for the Democratic Caucus. So she's in leadership in the majority, which is a very important development and important for prospects of her legislation being passed. And I think it's also very worth noting that she's the co-chair of the Congressional Black Caucus's Tech 2025 initiative. Um, she's been one of the most biggest supporters of computer science funding in Congress. 
Um, she runs an amazing um, congressional app challenge in her district, the 13th of California. Um, and over the years, she's had some amazing winners of the, the congressional app challenge competition. So let me just introduce um, Congressman Barbara Lee. Thank you, Tim, for that kind introduction. And thank you to the Internet Education Foundation and the Congressional App Challenge for inviting me to speak with you for a few minutes today. First, I would just like to acknowledge my constituent, Gianna Yan from Oakland, who recently won the Congressional App Challenge with an app aimed at increasing civic engagement among young people. This opportunity also inspired her to start her own workshop teaching young people of color in Oakland how to code. I am so proud of her. Providing equitable access to computer science education from preschool through high school is a critical step in preparing students for jobs in the 21st century global economy and empowers them to solve problems creatively in their own communities and around the world. The field of computer science is projected to grow by 22% through 2029, making it one of the fastest growing professions in the global economy. For too long, there has been a persistent lack of diversity in the tech industry. Only 34% of African-American students nationwide attend high schools that offer computer science courses. And, and of the advanced placement computer science exam takers, only 6% were African-American and 16% were Latino. Our young people, especially girls and young people of color, need Congress to invest in them so they are adequately prepared for the jobs of the future. As co-chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Tech 2025 initiative, I am working with my CBC colleagues to bring together the best minds of the tech, nonprofit, education, and public sectors to chart a path forward to increase African-American inclusion at all levels of the technology industry. My legislation to address persistent racial disparities in the tech sector through school grant programs was also just reintroduced and will be making its way through Congress. Congress must invest in computer science education by expanding areas of artificial intelligence and machine learning, cybersecurity, autonomous transportation and virtual and augmented reality to build the workforce of the future and yes to address some of our greatest challenges this will be key to strengthening our economy and the tech workforce thank you so much again for your work to expand access to computer science education keep up the great work so that was congressman barbara lee um, and another leader in congress i'm going to introduce um, to introduce her is um, the executive director of the Congressional App Challenge, uh, Joe Alessi, and he'll introduce uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. I mean, not Congresswoman Chrissy Holland. Hello, my name is Joseph Alessi, and I'm the program director at the Congressional App Challenge. The Congressional App Challenge is an initiative of the United States House of Representatives. Members of Congress host contests in their district for middle and high school students encouraging them to learn to code and inspiring them to pursue careers in computer science. Given our mission, we are constantly keeping a keen eye on the legislative prospects for computer science education funding in the 117th Congress. To that end, we were delighted to see Representative Lee introduce the Computer Science for All Act of 2021. Like the App Challenge, the Computer Science for All Act of 2021 aims to strengthen the skills of our future workforce by providing students with computer science education in elementary and secondary school. The act also hopes to reduce course equity gaps for students, resonating with our mission to engage students from communities that are traditionally underrepresented by the tech community. Like Representative Barbara Lee, Representative Chrissy Houlihan is one of the leading voices on CS funding and equity in Congress. Representative Houlihan is no stranger to STEM, holding an engineering degree from Stanford University. Representative Houlihan is the first woman to represent Pennsylvania's sixth congressional district. She's the founder of the Women in STEM Caucus and a proud App Challenge host. Welcome, Representative Houlihan. Hello, everyone, and thank you to the Congressional App Challenge team for having me here today for this important and timely conversation. 
My name is Chrissy Houlihan and I represent Pennsylvania's sixth district in Congress. And if I may, I'd like to share a bit of my background with you. First and foremost, I'm an engineer by training. I studied engineering at Stanford University on an ROTC scholarship. And from there, I went on to serve as an engineer in the Air Force where I focused on anti-ballistic missile defense. After serving, I pursued a master's of science degree in technology and policy at MIT. My family and I relocated from there to southeastern Pennsylvania, where I've helped found and scale several small and mid-sized businesses, including And One Basketball and B-Lab. After my time there, I began to serve with Teach for America, where I taught chemistry to high school juniors in North Philadelphia. As many of you in this room probably know, chemistry isn't exactly the easiest of sciences, but what makes it nearly impossible to learn is if you're reading at a third or fourth grade level, which many of my high school juniors were. So I took that observation and I went on to lead a nonprofit in Philadelphia that focused on early childhood literacy. And in 2018, I ran and was fortunate enough to become the first woman ever to represent my community in Congress. In DC and back home in Pennsylvania right now, the question on everyone's mind is where do we go from here? As a nation, as a people, as a community, as an economy? And of course the answer to those questions can't be summed up in 15 minutes, but I did want to focus on that last piece. Where does our economy go from here? What does the future of work look like? And how do we invest in the people who will be filling the jobs of tomorrow? As an engineer and entrepreneur, I feel uniquely suited to address those questions. Frankly, part of the reason why I ran for Congress was because I believed that I have a valuable and unique skill set that would lend itself to policymaking and advocacy on behalf of the people in my community and in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and in our country. As an engineer, I'm trained to identify a problem and to propose a solution. It's as simple as that. We use data, we use science, we work collaboratively, and we get the job done. Between us, I think we need more engineers, more computer sciences, scientists, and more people with STEM backgrounds in Congress. But that is a conversation for another day. So when it comes to rebuilding our economy and realizing a cohesive vision for the future of work, a lot of the discussion right now is centered around getting people back to work. Of course, that's a priority. But the fact of the matter is that many of those pre-pandemic jobs don't exist anymore. And many of the new jobs will be in the digital and technological sector. So a huge component of the conversation has to be on how we equip this next generation to do those jobs, to get the education that they need to be successful and to thrive in our rapidly changing economy. And that's the conversation that we're having here today. And so I'm so grateful that there are people here not only interested in having the conversation, but invested in taking action. It's critical that we invest in STEM education. For me, that's non-negotiable. STEM education provides not only a necessary subject in the education space, but one that will equip young Amer Americans with hireable skills. In the American Jobs Plan, I was proud to support provisions that included $48 billion for workforce development infrastructure and workforce protection, including support for career pathway programs in middle and high school to expand access to computer science and to career technical education. This is such an important step, but it really is only the beginning. And that's why bills like Congresswoman Lee's Bipartisan Computer Science for All Act, of which I'm a co-sponsor, is also so important. This legislation would direct the Department of Education to fund $250 million in new grants to provide computer science education for students in pre-K through 12th grade. These grants would help train teachers to better teach computer science, expand access to high quality learning materials and online learning options, help expand overall access to STEM classes and reduce course, course equity gaps for all students. What's really important about this legislation is its focus on young girls and on students of color, groups that are traditionally left behind in STEM education. And that needs to change. And this legislation is a critical step in addressing and beginning to bridge the racial and gender gaps that exist in computer science. I've also written and introduced my Mathematical and Statistical Modeling Education Act, which is both bipartisan and bicameral. This bill would address the National Science Foundation, would direct the National Science Foundation to create a competitive grants program focused on modernizing mathematics in STEM education through mathematical and statistical modeling. In other words, kids should learn how math can be applied outside of the classroom, 
so I helped to write a bill that would do just that. These are the kinds of bills that are very much at the center of this future of work conversation. Creating jobs and building a diverse talent pipeline to fill those jobs are two sides of the very same coin. And we build that talent pipeline by funding equitable education programs in the STEM sectors, including computer science, engineering, applied mathematics, and much more. And we ensure that our talent pipeline is diverse by investing in equitable education opportunities for students of all racial, gender, and economic backgrounds. Our STEM community will be at its strongest when we are at our most diverse. In Congress, I founded the very first ever Women in STEM Caucus. How crazy it is, is it that before 2019, such an organization didn't even exist? Lastly, the future of work conversation involves each and every one of you in this room. As an engineer, I'm prone to collaboration, and it's so important to have your voice at this legislative table. That's why I'm always really grateful to participate in these kinds of conversations, because my team and I get to hear directly from you, the people our legislation will impact, the STEM geniuses of tomorrow. So thank you so much for having me, and I hope to hear from you all soon. Um, that's great. Um, thank, uh, it's great uh, comments from uh, Congressman Houlihan. Um, those are two of our favorite members that host um, uh, congressional app challenges in their district, one in Oakland, one in Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. Um, one of, there are two of about 300 and maybe 35 members this year of the House that are going to host an app challenge. Um, and if you're a student, uh, make sure that you go to our website when we launch later this month um, to participate in the, the congressional app challenge for 2021. Um, so we hope, hope you'll, you'll join. But for now, um, the conversation is, will you as students, will students get the resources they need and teachers get the resources they need um, to kind of seed the workforce of the future um, and with regard to computer science and STEM education. And we have a great panel. We thought we'd ask them um, what, what the prospects are and what that should look like um, because really nobody knows what it all looks like. So I want to introduce this fantastic panel that we have today. Um, we have, first, we have Dr. Allison Scott, who's the CEO of the KPOR Foundation. Uh, Dr. Scott leads a research team aiming to enhance diversity in the tech ecosystem. Previously, she was a program leader for NIH's Enhancing the Diversity of the NIH-Funded Workforce Program. She's had a long and impressive career uh, devoted to impressing, uh, improving STEM outcomes for underrepresented, underrepresented groups. Um, Dr. Pam Buffington is the co-director of STEM programs at the Education Development Center. Uh, Dr. Buffington is a national expert on rural education and improving K-12 through student outcomes. She leads EDC's Rural and Ready STEM Initiative. Um, and she's from Maine, whereas um, Dr. Scott is in like Oakland, I believe. So they're on uh, opposite coasts. Uh, Jake Baskin uh, is the ex executive director of the Computer Science Teachers Association um, and one of our uh, partners who are very proud um, partners with the Congressional App Challenge. Um, Jake is a former high school computer science teacher, department chair, professional development provider in the, with the Chicago Public Schools. Um, and he's formerly with Code.org, which, which is a great organization to promote computer science education in, in America. As I said, Jake's, um, Jake's from right in the middle between Dr. Scott and Dr. Buffington um, in Chicago. And um, with that, I'd like to just go to um, the panel with, the, with my opening question, which is, do you feel, uh, Dr. Scott, that we're at a historic moment, a historic moment for funding of computer science education with either the American Jobs Plan under President Biden or another bill like Congressman Barbara Lee's or both? Well, thank you so much for hosting this conversation. And as you mentioned, and as uh, we heard from the representatives, it is a really exciting uh, moment in time. And so it's great to see this momentum kind of building around CS education in this session and to see mention of CS in the jobs plan. Um, in terms of this moment, I think it's important to talk about the, the pivotal moment in time that I think was referenced earlier um, that really requires some coordinated efforts, large scale commitments and investments across agencies if we're going to actually see computer science for all become a reality. Um, so there's like three kind of, uh, converging factors as I see them. Um, one is we've heard a lot of conversation about the need to prepare all students to participate in an increasingly tech driven future. Um, two, underrepresentation of students of color and girls and rural students and low income students, which um, directly affects the lack of diversity in the tech sector. And then three, which all of us uh, should be a, a, a bipartisan concern. Um, all of us should care about our nation's future workforce and global competitiveness, the growth of um, tech jobs, the demand for talent, our global competitiveness. 
Um, and countries across the globe, as we know, are actually making significant investments in CS education. So we have a lot more work to do here. Um, so again, exciting to see a commitment to CS education. Um, and um, I would argue that it is time for us to invest heavily. And I know we'll get into some details about how those investments um, might be might be best. Met. Great, Dr. Scott, Dr. Buffington, um, you know, with regard to underrepresented groups, uh, rural is certainly part of that. Can, can you kind of talk about from your perspective where we are with regard to this? Are we at a historic moment uh, for moving the ball forward and will it be for everyone? Doctor, I think you're on mute. We have to have at least one person do that in every. <laughs> so yes, I think we're at an, an incredibly important and pivotal moment um, in a world driven by technology, core concepts and skills in computer science education are foundational to the future of work across all careers and industry uh, sectors. And um, not only for students in rural places, but all students moving into CS careers. Um, and not just specifically CS careers, but CS skill enhanced success in across careers. Um, and so I think that the, the rising tide of technolo technological literacy, you know, greater tech and IT literacy is expected across the workforce and people have to be able to locate that information, use and create apps as your challenge really helps support create effective electronic presentations, work in virtual teams and um, modify programs and so on, all requiring levels of digital and CS fluency. So that's critical now. And to the question about the Biden American jobs plan, um, ensuring universal and affordable broadband access is an essential aspect of infrastructure for the US to be a global leader in research, discovery and innovation. So the American Jobs Plan is designed to invest up to 100 billion in broadband infrastructure in rural America to build upon the unique assets of rural communities and people and to create jobs and revitalize economic growth. An essential aspect of realizing that potential is the investment in education to acquire computer science, computational thinking and big, da big data skills, investments and climate and smart technologies in US agricultural structure embedded in the American Jobs Plan will also need to include upskilling of existing rural workforce with enduring math, science, engineering, computer science practices, such as communication, problem solving, communication, analyzing data, and so on, and applying computational thinking in that context. This can all be supported by the Rural Partnership Program in the American Jobs Plan and its jobs plan more broadly. So um, I do think that additional legislation is needed to increase equity and access to STEAM learning, uh, including CS and CT, particularly for underrepresented groups of students from families living below the poverty line, rural, black, indigenous, people of color, and girls and women. Um, so I think that it's, it's important um, that we act and we act in multiple different ways across um, different sectors and different aspects of legislation to make that happen. Uh, thank you. And we can, maybe we can come back a little bit in the conversation and the Q question and answer about um, broadband deployment and also ed tech bonds, which are both kind of simple, similar but necessary for computer science education funding. But let's go to, let's go to Jake with my original question, which is, um, um, you know, are we at a pivotal moment and Jake, Jake's been doing this and paying attention to funding initiatives and in government for probably about a good solid eight years now between uh, Computer Science Teachers Association and Code.org. Jake, what do you think? Yeah, well, first, I just uh, want to say thanks for inviting me on this panel. Uh, as, as you were reading the bios, I couldn't help but think, like, how, how did I end up on this panel with such incredible co-panelists? Um, it's, it's really an honor to, to be sharing the stage with you all. Um, I, I think uh, my, my answer to this question, are we at a historic moment is I really hope so. We are so long past due to focus on computer science education and computer science education on its own, separate from STEM or from other fields. Um, I'm not gonna repeat what everyone else just said about the economic imperatives, the social imperatives, um, thinking about the, the sort of global competition that's happening on top of all of that, I just can't imagine being an informed citizen in the world right now without a foundational understanding of computer science. Uh, imagine going through your day without understanding how the apps on your phone work or how the internet is connected. Uh, 
it, it would make the world seem like magic. And so on top of all of these incredibly compelling reasons from an economic or um, sort of global perspective, uh, it's just the right thing to do. It is so important that we prepare students so that they're ready to interact with the world that we already live in. Th thanks, Jake. Um, let's let's go back to I think um, one thing that um, you know Dr. Scott had mentioned is you know how do how do we make sure that you know these outcomes are evenly distributed, inclusive, um, and, and and account for all folks. I think um, uh, underrepresented communities rural, uh, poor, and I think in, in Congresswoman uh, Barbara Lee's bill, um, HR 3602, um, she also places an important focus on um, Native American and Indigenous peoples, which is I mean, a, an entirely huge aspect of um, you know, underserved communities. Um, can we kind of elaborate more on that, Dr. Scott? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and in our work at the K4 Center, we focus a lot on computer science equity um, and I personally believe this is one of the most critical components to pay attention to as we think about the overall um, investment to expand CS for all students. Um, you were mentioning kind of just looking at looking at uh, what, what we have accomplished over the last decade or so, um, and we've put a lot of effort into broadening participation, um, but we still have students of color, low-income students, girls vastly underrepresented. So. Um, I think some of the statistics were already already read, but I think it's helpful to just kind of ground us in those. So um, Black, Latinx, and Native students are less likely to have access to CS courses in their schools. Um, they're also less likely to enroll in CS courses, so we have enrollment disparities. Um, girls account for only about a third of all students taking CS courses. Um, in terms of Black students, just over 2,500 Black students took the AP Computer Science A exam, which is a, a strong predictor of going on to major in computer science. And so when we think about these disparities and how to close those gaps, um, it's really important, I think, that we target our, our efforts and our initiatives um, and that we are thinking about how to close racial, socioeconomic, and gender gaps. So this can happen in a bunch of different ways. Um, we can go into more detail, but I think some of what has already been mentioned in Congresswoman Lee's um, bill is things like targeted grants, investment in R&D, investing in a more diverse teacher workforce. Um, but I would love to see it be clearly articulated how some of these investments will close those gaps of access and opportunity. Right, and we would love to see the language as well. Um, we do have the language of Congresswoman Lee's legislation, which we'll post as well. Um, but the, the aspects of the American Jobs Plan um, are opaque to us. Um, and as far as I can tell, I can't find anyone that I know in the city um, that has read that bill. Maybe Jake has read it, you know, yes or no. Um, it, it's being held pretty close to the vest as part of this negotiation. But think about this. Um, the infrastructure bill, as, um, as Dr. Buffington had pointed out, includes um, funds for closing what we call maybe the digital divide or the, or the broadband gap. Um, it's really hard to have a good educational outcome particularly in a pandemic world and even in a pre and post pandemic world without access to the internet and, and all the learning it enables. Um, so that's huge. And then also the American Rescue Plan, which was the original bill that actually has passed, um, apparently includes um, funding for education technology fund, uh, resources for schools and libraries. So we call it ed tech. Um, so we're investing in perhaps, you know, broadband infrastructure and education technology isn't it important that we have um, uh, funding for the teachers that'll teach those tech, teach those technologies and the students having AP classes that will be, it just, does that make sense that this would follow that the American Jobs Plan would have funding that would enable those two other plans to work? Um, I'm not sure who the question is too, but I'll, I'll answer, um, absolutely. I think it, it's really critical and um, to the point of, you know, inclusivity and, um, and also the need for the kind of supports you're talking about. When I speak of rural schools, um, rural schools and community are, are not monolithic. They are culturally, racially, ethnically diverse and include um, a lot of tribal communities and so on. So just um, making sure that when I make these kinds of statements that we're really talking about the importance of meeting in the needs of underserved and underrepresented groups and CS and STEM more broadly. Computer science courses and experiences are less available to students in rural schools and communities 
in classrooms. So these, there are at least three critical drivers for increasing equitable access to CS and CT. And when I say CT, I mean computational thinking um, opportunities. And they include integrating, increasing the, the support for integrating computer science practices and principles into core instruction. Um, and providing targeted professional development for rural educators in the rural workforce, supporting connections with local rural businesses to develop shared understandings about what these computer science and computational thinking practices and skills look like when they're enacted in the classroom, but also when they're enacted in it, you know, the workforce as well as the educational setting. So, so how do we do that? I think that we need specific funding um, as is in this targeted legislation, but also other supports that are specifically targeted for professional development. I've been um, actually I I taught computer science, physics, and mathematics for about 20 years, and then have been in the education, research, and development, and professional development support sort of realm for the last 20. Um, and what what I've seen happen over time is that there there's really important needed investment. In, in research and development, but not nearly enough, but there's less targeted support for these kinds of professional development supports as are described in, um, in, the, in the bill um, HR 3620. Training teachers, expanding access to high quality learning materials and opportunities in CSCT and big data skills, access to rigorous STEAM classes, and in a rural context, the A might mean art, but it might also mean art agriculture. Um, these are essential, essential for um, for the success of the not only the rural economy, but also the economy and um, preparedness of the United States. So, um, so yes, I think that's critical. And um, as an example, in our organization, we have um, a lot of computer science um, professional development supports, specifically addressing underrepresented um, youth. And one of those is, is in early elementary where we integrate uh, block-based coding and SNAP into the mathematics curriculum. So it's, in that particular project is called Math Plus C. So it's embedded so that elementary teachers who are in, ha, with having lots of demands on their time can integrate the mathematics and the science and the computer science together and then, um, and then it's more able to, to build that kind of trajectory of learning um, for students. And so um, I noticed that, um, Tim, um, so, so I think that that is really critical. Yeah, I apologize. That's my daughter's enormous St. Bernard barking in the background. I, I apologize. <laughs> um, I, he, he, he was agreeing with everything you said, Pam. Um, and, and it's worth noting, um, I think Mitch, Mitch Kapoor um, from the Kapoor Center um, is fond of mentioning that talent knows no zip code. Um, and one third of participants, uh, members who participate in the Congressional Lab Challenge, their districts are defined as rural. So it has an incredible, you know, in addition to like Congresswoman Barbara Lee's district and Chrissy Hooligan's district, we also have very rural districts that participate in the App Challenge. Um, and the thing is about that is that sometimes people don't think about, you know, what the you know kids in rural areas when they code an app they're going to try to solve some you know global problem um the reality is that just like kids everywhere um, students in rural areas when they code an app they're trying to solve a local problem something in their community something in their school something in their family um and you know computer science problems no no zip code either so um if i could just ask um you know, jake when it comes to you know we're, we're giving we're providing money for ed, ed, ed tech uh, we're going to provide, we're definitely going to provide some money for broadband infrastructure and broadband access. Um, would it be a missed opportunity not to invest in the future workers of technology in the future, which are students in high school and middle school? I mean, I, it, this is absolutely the time to make these investments and make sure that we prepare teachers with the skills and knowledge to take advantage of the earlier investments you just mentioned around bringing technology in the classroom, making broadband more available. Um, we uh, just this uh, past year uh, actually completed a landscape report of K-12 CS teachers in partnership with the K-4 Center. I mean, it informs a lot of what sort of supports CS teachers are looking for. And, and it's important to understand why we, we should focus on CS and CS teachers specifically. Um, 
Most CS teachers, the vast majority, do not have a degree in computer science or CS education. Uh, when you compare that to only 30% of math teachers, 30% uh, uh, of novice math teachers and 18% of, of more experienced math teachers. There's just this huge difference in prior experience that we need to support. Um, and we're talking uh, very specifically about addressing clear equity gaps in participation. And we know that that can happen through culturally relevant pedagogy. And uh, in fact, uh, almost a majority, a, a little uh, a little bit, uh, more than half of CS teachers uh, don't feel equipped to uh, effectively use culturally relevant pedagogy in their classrooms right now. There's a clear opportunity through investment in professional development to support teachers as they grow into this space uh, and, and make sure that we're, we're giving them the, the techniques that will uh, help close the, the gaps that we're talking about directly. So uh, one of the things I mentioned I'd come back to was um, that this we're, we're co-hosting this with our State of the Net project, uh, which is a purely internet policy project. Um, we carve up issues like cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, broadband, um, you know, data privacy, things like that. And uh, one of the things that you know we thought was important from our perspective when we talk about these issues all day, um, artificial intelligence antitrust, patents, everything, um, is that when it comes to our federal objectives for policy, we talk about a race to uh, artificial intelligence um, and a race to quantum computing. Um, and um, we need more cybersecurity um, workers in America. And I wonder, you know, we have all these federal objectives and all these companies are asking the White House to have all these initiatives on these topics. But you know, the reality is that I don't know where these workers are gonna come from if they're not gonna be um, trained or inspired in high school and middle school to pursue computer science. Um, can someone, you know, can we talk about that just a little bit? Because um, right now, President Biden just got done with a, a summit with President Putin. And as far as I can tell, the summit wasn't about nuclear weapons, it was about cyber weapons. And President Biden was saying, well, we have capability too. Shouldn't we invest, if we want to achieve these federal policy goals, shouldn't we invest in the workers that'll help us achieve them? Um, well, I'll, I'll give a, just a thought. I Absolutely. I mean, in, in, to ensure we have a workforce capable of leading world driven by technology, they need to be fully prepared. So starting early and moving through the, um, through the CS trajectory, starting at you know, elementary schools, um, setting a foundation for, for computer science, integrating more computational thinking into mathematical classrooms um, is critical. Career exploration um, at middle levels, along with the type of coding and computer science opportunities, integrating more um, technological tools into math and science classes. Um, we know that it's, it's critical and there should be additional rich and robust selection of computer science courses and electives in high school in order to, um, to really prepare for the kind of cybersecurity um, issues that you're talking about, students need to gain understanding of what those not only skills are, but also a career awareness of, of what that looks like. What does CS and CT look like in action? And it's not just um, computer science professionals. It's integrated in, across um, um, job and education opportunities. So really making those kinds of skills, values, and interests embedded within the, the infrastructure of schools is really important. Yeah, I would just add, I totally agree with everything Dr. Buffington just said. And, and going back to something that Jake said at the outset, how I think we need to think about how um, individuals are being prepared to even just function in society. Then we think about, okay, well, what are all of the ranges of career opportunities? And I think it requires us to shift our mentalities slightly from what the, I would say the older um, uh, approach to computer science education, which was, okay, you take a select group of students might take computer science courses, and then those students are fast-tracked into computer engineering roles. Right now, we what we are seeing is every student needs access to computer science. Every student needs to understand how computer science is integrated across all subject areas and across every single field. And I absolutely love the idea of, of career exploration to the points that you're making about cyber and about autonomous vehicles and even in rural communities around the intersection between computing and 
agriculture. And um, there are so many different connections that are important to make. And I think, um, back to your point, Tim, we absolutely have to be investing in this rigorous approach to the entire workforce of the future, not a small select group of, of students who we would invest in to be like the CS innovators of the future. Uh, Jake, I dare you to, to disagree. I, I could never, I, I, com I completely agree. And, and, and I think the thing I would add is as we talk about some of these specific threats that, that we may be facing in the CS world, um, I, I also think 10 years ago when I was starting to teach high school computer science, um, none of those were on the forefront of you know, the, the New York Times headlines or, or what people were worried about. And uh, on top of preparing students to enter those careers and to address the challenges, a broad based foundation in computer science will prepare all students for the five, the list of five things that we don't know about yet that will be uh, on everyone's mind 10 to 15 years from now um, as technology advances and, and continuing to focus on that foundation of CS is a way to make sure we're prepared both for what is an immediate need and what's in the future. Um, I'm, I've been trying to get you guys to disagree through this entire panel. So I, one more, I'm going to try one more time. Um, there's a difference of opinion on this, at least here at our office. You know, we talk about um, sometimes trying to, we're trying to inspire students to pursue um, computer science and, and, and STEM careers. Um, it turns out that um, having the Congressional Medal of Coding and winning that Congressional Medal of Coding um, turns out to be really inspirational for students. And we're thrilled that um, they don't really get much uh, besides having their app displayed in the Capitol building um, for a year uh, for winning the app challenge or their district's app challenge. Um, but we, you know, we try to inspire them. And, and I think sometimes we talk about um, what an investment in computer science uh, means and what's the return on investment. And oftentimes um, you have a lot of folks that go into computer science students that can end up, you know, achieving a pretty good middle class, you know, paycheck um, without a huge investment in what has become, you know, um, higher education has become incredibly expensive um, and capital intensive. And when you go into graduate degrees, it gets even more capital intensive. Um, even a full blown computer science degree um, is capital intensive, but, you know, coding can get you pretty far with not a lot of capital investment in education. Um, do we, do we think that there's, you know, there's value in kind of a, a faster way to a middle-class paycheck um, with coding? Um, and that may be different from, you know, more intensive STEM careers or more like PhD in computer science or master's in computer science. Um, can we, can we sell computer science education to students, um, that don't have a lot of capital resources to spend a lot of money on higher education. No one's biting. It may be I'm happy degree. to jump in. And, I know and that, say, I don't <laughs> disagree. We need to get something to weigh in, but like who starts first? All right, you you jumped on it, so Jake is up to you. I'll go from there. Well, well, I think I'll say like they, they, yes, it, it is clear that. Um, Computer science may be leading the way in what could be a broader um, revolution in how, what sort of credentials prepares, prepare folks for jobs in the future. Um, I, I think it may be that we're, it's a field where we're more open to some flexibility in that earlier on. Um, I, I also want to caution, uh, and, and this it goes back to drawing on what, what I saw happen when I was I was a CTE teacher. You know, that is a pathway that is designed to lead towards certification, often and and sort of um, a different uh, different expectations than four year college. And we have to make sure that when we set up systems like this, we're not setting up systems where students like me get told you should go get a CS degree at, at Stanford and students who were black or young women or Latinx end up being told you should go through this pathway and end up with a certification so that you can have this entry level coding job. Um, and and um, there is this incredible opportunity to change what credentials are required, but we have to be really careful about the disparities that they can create if we aren't um, watching what sort of tracking happens in that process. And I'm I'm totally in agreement <laughs> with Jake. And I know that if you were hoping for disagreement, uh, you didn't get it here. But I do want to say, um, you know, that discovery and innovation comes from the intersections of the disciplines of, of technology and, and science technology, like if we're thinking about computational biology, or we're talking about um, I'm doing work in rural communities um, all over the nation, but in, in a particular place where we're looking at big data, um, those skills, those computational thinking, 
um, computer science skills, and the ski industry. They intersect. Um, we, they, if you look at um, aquaculture, which we have a lot of new aquaculture businesses, you know, in Maine and so on along the coast. Those really, you don't go to those just because you like fishing. You can actually engage in computer science and um, analysis of, of fishing populations and so on. I think that the route by which people go to learn and then apply these skills will vary. You don't have to go to a computer science um, um, degree or a PhD to be applying those skills. And for some students, they can go to a community college and then higher ed, or they can go, I mean, there are many different um, flexible pathways. The critical part is, as, as Jake said, that none of those pathways are close to a particular individual based on who they are and the particular characteristics they bring to, to this. They, it should be built on assets and aspirations, and we should build, continue to build those aspirations for kids. But the, it's okay to go, I mean, I think that the, the broader thing is how that investment is made, maybe some in some cases is made more upfront in terms of a, a four year um, higher ed um, opportunity or somebody else goes through a different path, but the, the, their, the investment could be over time, you know, so there, it's, it's really important to think about how these, how these things come together and, and one is not um, better. I think it's about value of the importance of education opportunities engagement um, and, and satisfaction in what they're doing. And it doesn't have to be um, a traditional um, computer science um, you know, uh, degree. It could be some other permutation of that. And Dr. Scott, you have my last hope for disagreement. I'm so sorry, Tim, to disappoint you. <laughs> I can't find anything to disagree with here. <laughs> um, I do, I, I would just add one other opportunity, which is thinking about the adult workforce um, and thinking about how we, we know based on all of the economic trends that we're going to have to invest heavily in upskilling and reskilling. And so I do think that there's a great opportunity to think differently, right? We're not asking adult workers who have skills in specific areas to go back to school through a four-year path. But I think that there are some unique opportunities for um, apprenticeship programs aligned to very specific industries and companies. Um, investing in just like building the local workforce as tech companies continue to grow and expand. Um, and I think that's a, a great opportunity for us to, to consider. Um, so I, I think I, I forgot to mention um, Congressman Barbara Lee's um, bill HR 3602. Um, also is, 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 is bipartisan. Uh, Congressman Chuck Fleischer, Fleischman, um, he's a Republican. He's a, he's a co-sponsor of that. And I think um, this is one of those things that the bipartisanship is, is obvious. The Congressional App Challenge, when it comes to the members of the House participating, it's almost evenly divided um, between you know, Democrats and Republicans. Um, you know, inspiring students to code and promoting computer science um, among constituents is incredibly bipartisan. Um, so I think that's gonna be one of those important things as we go forward. Um, we, we have kind of been tracking about a dozen bills in Congress right now, and they don't include the American Jobs Plan or the Infrastructure Bill or the, res uh, the Rescue Plan or the, the Families Plan. Um, but these are just bills that are introduced by members, some Republican, some Democrat. Um, and we will put those out on social media later today or tomorrow, um, the list that we have compiled um, um, going forward. I think, you know, if I could close, um, you know, with folks in the last few minutes we have left, I think we, you know, half of the folks that are, are on our congressional staff, half of them are students, um, and some of them are from the private sector. I guess um, for any of those audiences, like um, what would you say is necessary? Like what should they do um, as far as reaching out to members and reaching out to the Biden administration um, to help promote um, computer science? And hopefully this funding will be passed and they'll have resources. What, what would you say to students and parents and teachers? Well, I think one thing I would say is computer science, computational thinking, um, and these enduring practices that are embedded across computer science, math, science, and technology, those enduring practices are critical for the future of work. Um, that there, we, we know there are, um, there, there are great assets that are not being tapped um, in our communities and that computer science provides an opportunity 
We know that, um, for example, many communities are significantly underfunded and rural, rural communities are, are also in critical. I mean, eight of 10 counties in the US experiencing persistent poverty in rural counties. It's extremely important to invest in technological tools and professional training in these schools, um, support a, a variety of different and flexible pathways for um, upskilling um, and reskilling, as you were pointing out, as well as um, the K through six, pre-K through 16 um, community uh, in terms of professional training um, and invest in community colleges, as well as other higher ed and other, um, other professional learning opportunities um, for people to attain, attain these skills because these are foundational, um, critical, um, it means investments in equipment and technology as well as people and um, learning. And that's, that's what these um, investments are about and it's, it's critical regardless of the particular occupation um, that these are, will be there for the whole future of work. Jake or Dr. Scott? Sure, yeah, I can just add, um, I think two, two things that could be incredibly helpful. Um, one is arming, I, all of us should arm ourselves with those key talking points. Why does computer science matter? Why is it important for our future? You know, how should we be thinking about making investments? I think um, we also work in California on the Computer Science for All Coalition. And what we've learned from that work is uh, we can, drive a lot of change just from individual conversations. A student going to a school and saying, I would like to see a computer science course at my high school, why, why is it not being offered? Principals will say, students haven't told us that there's a demand. So once students say there's a demand, we'll offer the course. Parents can also do the same thing and advocate for um, their schools. So there's things that can happen at the federal level, obviously through the legislation that we're discussing, but every individual also has the opportunity to help drive some of this change at the, at the more local level. Yeah, and, and I would say that um, uh, every time a, a, a student um, team wins the Congressional App Challenge for their district, um, usually a member uh, interviews them or meets them at their high school, or we have a demo day where we bring them to the Capitol building pre-pandemic to demonstrate their app to their member, the member and in the community. And you know the impact that that has from a student from their district talking about the app that they created to solve a problem in their district um, is incredibly powerful. Um, and so uh, these, these students are, any one of those teams of students is better than like 10 lobbyists. So um, uh, <laughs> um, we, I, would, I, would, I would echo that, Dr. Scott. And Jake? Yeah, I think on, on top of everything that was said, sort of the, the three key things I think about is, is one, and this probably isn't a surprise given my, given my organization, but we need to continue investing in teachers and investing in teachers deeply. That is the lever that we have to make the change we're talking about. We need to make sure that that investment is specifically CS focused. Uh, without that, it will get drowned out in other fields and STEM more broadly and, and lost in that space. Uh, and three, we, we have to keep our eye on a focus of equitable and inclusive teaching practices of, of the foundations of CS. Um, if, if we don't continue to come back to that in every conversation and every way we look at this, it, it will also get lost And making sure we, we don't just increase the number of students participating in CS without changing that ratio of who's able to participate and who's able to succeed. Uh, Dr. Scott, Dr. Buffington, Jake, I want to thank you for participating. For the students that are on, um, on listening to this, and we will gonna, we're going to record this and, and push this out um, in bits over the next few days. Um, for the students and teachers listening, um, we'll be starting the next Congressional App Challenge in just a few weeks. You can go to congressionalappchallenge.us uh, and pre-register to participate. Um, worth noting that over half of the students that participate um, code their winning apps um, outside of the classroom. So you don't have to have it be part of your school curriculum uh, to participate in the App Challenge. You could just be really excited about computer science and, and we encourage you to participate. And once you do, just make sure that um, you, you express to your member how important computer science education is to you. So that'd be great. So I wanna thank all of you. Thank you for attending uh, uh, Congressman Barbara Lee and Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan. And um, we'll, we'll be following this and we'll keep sending folks updates on this issue. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tim.